Hi everyone, it's Katie from Ireland Before You Die. We're here in Ballina Hinch, County Down to check out Hinch Distillery's gin experience. Let's go. All right folks, welcome to Hinch Distillery. My name's Corey. I'm gonna be your gin instructor today. Um, you have a nice wee gin and tonic in front of you. It's deconstructed. I could have poured them all for you, but that's an awful lot of work. Um, but this is a nice way just to access all the different elements to a gin and tonic itself and to just help and build it up. So inside our little nosing glass here, we have a 35 mil measure of our ninth wave Irish gin. Alongside our Hinch Whiskey, our ninth wave Irish gin is our main gin product that we distill here. And we have a white label, which is our standard cut sitting at 43%, and the black label is now our export strength cut. It's slightly stronger, sitting at 46% ABV, um, and it was initially launched across the pond in the United States. If we go in for a little smell, on the nose we're talking spice and citrus going on there. Some people do just smell gin, and they're absolutely right as well. But you get those sort of lemony notes jumping out at you alongside some hints of black pepper coming out as well. And um, a little sip just sort of on the palate. Obviously you get over that initial kick of alcohol and you do get access then to those lovely botanicals all tied together now in the liquid itself. We can pop that now in on top of our glass with ice. The ice is really now going to lift all those botanicals as well. So another little whiff makes it a much nicer, more summery style gin. And on top of that then, we can add a little splash of tonic water. <clears throat> you notice we are gonna be using a plain flavored tonic. Um, our distillers will recommend a two to one ratio of tonic water to gin, so it's about half of the wee bottle I've just used there. We are partnered with Schweppes here at Tinch. Any big gin drinker will tell you that the flavor should be coming from the gin as opposed to the mixture itself. Um, example, if we were to add the likes of lemonade on top of a gin, all you're really gonna taste is lemonade. So we like to stick with the plain flavored tonic and get access to all the flavor notes coming from the gin itself. On top of that then, we have a little lime wedge. Give that a squash and pop it in. And those citrusy notes now that we talked about will be really sort of tied together and really lifted now just by the addition of the lime on top of that. So with that then, folks, you can now consider yourselves fully qualified bartenders. You know now how to make the perfect gin and tonic, so cheers to that. Um, so the ninth wave itself, um, the name is a bit of a triple header. Um, most gins you come across are going to use between six and ten different botanicals. We have used nine. Um, on top of that, we're going to use nine kilograms of juniper berries in every batch that we distill. Juniper berries having to be the predominant botanical in order for this to carry the name of a gin. And then the ninth wave itself, it's a nice wee nod to Celtic mythology. Um, Manon McLear, he lived around the north coast of Antrim. Uh, name translates roughly to son of the sea. Um, he was interpreted as somewhat of a sea god, the ruler or the guardian of the other world as it was known. Um, so the story went, you can still see it today, if you're standing down at the beach with the waves lapping in at your feet, it's always said that the ninth wave is going to be the biggest and the strongest of those waves. So the legend had it, a little fisherman out doing a spot of fishing in a small boat or vessel would have encountered this ninth wave now, would have been towering over them the size of a house. One of two things was going to happen. Option A, you were going to conquer this wave, you were going to get through it, you were going to get over it. Didn't matter how, you would come out the other side regarded as pretty much invincible, nigh on indestructible, same sort of way many people might feel after a full bottle of gin, so it's quite relatable. Um, option B, not as fine and dandy, you're going to get wiped out and you drown. This is not all doom and gloom though. If this were to happen by way of the ninth wave, you were thought to be granted immediate access into the kingdom of MacLear, this other world that I had mentioned. It's pretty much heaven on earth. Um, so it's a bit of a win-win situation, um, and that gives us our strap line, discover your other world that we're talking about there. So our botanicals that I had talked about, we use nine botanicals here in our ninth wave Irish gin. Botanicals are pretty much just the ingredients to a gin that give it those flavor profiles and the aromas that we're talking about there at the start. And um, we can think about gin kind of like a bit of a perfume. We're gonna have base notes that are gonna be the exact same in almost every single gin you'll come across. And then we have middle notes and top notes, which is where you really start to diverge in terms of flavor and smell. We've gone for spicy middle notes, citrusy top notes. So our base three, the first we're gonna talk about, we have juniper berries, coriander seeds, and angelica root. The juniper berries, like I said, they have to be the predominant botanical in order for this to be called a gin. A cousin of the conifer family gives them a nice warm piney kick to them. Also allows them to grow fairly well in our climate here as well. So our coriander seeds then, Second base botanical, you might have heard of these before, you might have cooked with them as well. Present in a lot of curry dishes, 
and they're going to give off a nice warm peppery kick now just this early stage helps to really liven things up a little bit and then the angelica root might not have heard of this one before it's the root of the angelica flower and it's wet state it's actually poisonous uh, we've dehydrated it, so there's no real cause for concern there and um, even in its dehydrated state though it can have a bit of a novocaine effect on your mouth it can kind of numb you out a wee bit and um, whenever i had started here i had to do my taste training a little nibble a little smell of each of the botanicals just so i really knew what i was talking about and with this Novocaine anesthetic property, after about three or four minutes of chewing on this angelic root, I started to talk a little bit like this. Um, again, the same could sort of be said after six, seven or eight glasses of gin. Um, so now you know who to blame. This is the culprit, the angelica root. Um, so as I said, these are going to be our base three notes. Pretty much in every single gin, they're going to be the exact same. And these are referred to as the Holy Trinity or the Big Three. It was always predominantly juniper berries and then coriander and angelica. Found their way into the mix then just as the years went on. We'll move on then to our spicy middle layer, cardamom, cassia bark, and the grains of paradise. Cardamom, again, might have heard of this one, might have cooked with it also. Present in a lot of curry dishes as well. Gives off a real warm, fiery heat now at this early stage. Um, and you can really sort of get a smell of that too. Uh, the cassia bark, it's the bark of the cassia tree, who would have thought? And um, this is a cousin of the cinnamon family, so you get a nice warm cinnamon aroma coming off of this. We like to refer to this one as a little glass of Christmas. <clears throat> and our final spicy botanical now, we're talking the grains of paradise. They're the seeds of the paradise flower, they originate from the west coast of Africa, namely Ghana. Um, and these are just like little fireballs. These would have been used around the 1700s and 1800s by sealers at a time whenever black pepper corns weren't as readily available to them as they are to us now. They would have taken a few of these grains of paradise, ground them up, popped them into a dish, giving them a bit of flavor, a bit of a kick, and helping to protect them a wee bit from the cold as well. So those are our three spicy botanicals, our middle notes, and then we move on to balance those out with our beautiful citrusy top notes now. We have lemon peel, lemon verbena, and the orris root. Lemon peel, pretty self-explanatory. It's a dehydrated rind of a lemon. Uh, it gives a nice, fresh, juicy burst now at this stage. Uh, the lemon verbena, again, citrusy vibes coming off of this one. This is a very unique botanical in a lot of gins, would be associated more so with the likes of soap or hand sanitizer. Hopefully you're not getting any hints of that coming through. Um, and then the orris root. This is our final botanical. Looks just like a jar of fancy gravel, and it tastes very much like a jar of fancy gravel as well. You do get hits of tea coming off of this one though as well, and some people find if you sucked on it for long enough, you do get hints of white chocolate coming through there as well. <clears throat> so our orris root and the angelica root, both of these are gonna be in the gin in very minimal quantities. They're not really going to contribute massively to the smell or to the flavour. They're going to work more so as the likes of salt wood to your dish, just to work to tie all of the other botanicals together and really lift the smells and flavours that come off of those. Those are our nine botanicals then that we use in our ninth way of Irish gin. Some of these are going to be available to you next door in distillate form. I'll explain a wee bit more about what that means whenever we get in there. Uh, alongside some other very different botanicals, because the whole idea of gin school is that you're going to build up your very own individual flavour approach. It would be quite pointless if I just give you the nine that we use and said, go make something fabulous. With that being said, some people do finish up their ninth wave whenever they're in here and say, that was just amazing. I'm going to go in next door and I'm going to make ninth wave Irish gin. It's not really much point in doing that because we've already perfected it. And if you really love it, go and find a bottle in the shop. But this is quite a unique way experience. What I normally say is just sort of you do you, cater to your own individual flavor palette. And we'll finish up in here and we'll head next door, learn about the distillation process of our gin, and then we'll get cracking on with gin school. So this is our gin still. His name's David. Uh, David is named after the owner's late son. And David helps us to produce all of our ninth wave Irish gin. As you can see on our nice little sign here, ninth wave Irish gin was the world's most highly awarded gin in 2020. 2020, the year of the pandemic, as you know, was not the best year for socialising, but it was a very good year for drinking. So it might have been one of the best years we could have won that award. So everything that passes through this entire process will now come through this small glass vessel. This is known as a gin fountain. I know, who would not want a gin fountain? Uh, the first 15 litres that pass through here are known as the heads. They're going to be cloudy and blue, just like the gin that we talked about in the early days. They're gonna be blue in color now because they contain very high levels of methanol. Methanol in high quantities 
can be fatal and even in low doses can cause you to lose your eyesight and that's where they initially got the phrase blind drunk from so needless to say we do not want any of these heads we're just going to cut them off and hold them separately everything else then that runs through here will be our crystal clear ninth wave irish gin this entire process is enough to produce around 600 litres of gin, enough for about 850 bottles or so. Um, and that whole process takes around three to three and a half hours. In terms of whiskey, we're talking just over a week for production and then three years on top of that then to age you to become an Irish whiskey. But in three and a half hours, we can make the same amount of gin. So that's why I'd said next door that your gin is your real cash cow. Very, very quick to turn around your profits. We could theoretically run this up to five times a day. We could have the gin chilling out downstairs overnight, bottled up the next day, in the shops end of the week, money back in the bank end of the month, just like that. As I say, whiskey, we're waiting over three years for that money to come back. So what our distillers have done for our gin school today is they've run this whole process through a number of different times, using just one botanical now with each run. This allows them to produce a flavored distillate the liquids that you're going to be using today are 40% alcohol flavored with just one botanical. So we'll have a liquid over there flavored with just lemon peel, one with just orange peel, elderberries, peppermint, moving on now from all these different ones that we will use in our ninth wave. What you're going to do is you're going to take all of your equipment that you have in front of you. You're going to go and collect all these different liquids now in different ratios and quantities. You will bring them back to your table, blend them up and bring home your very own bottle of gin. Uh, totally personal to you there's not going to be another bottle of gin in the whole world like this and sometimes that's a very good thing some people make nothing short of an abomination but let's see what you've got in you today and um, so we'll get you seated now i'll explain your instructions and then i'll let you loose Alrighty, folks so um, i'm going to now talk you through all of the instructions that you need in order to be successful and to graduate from gin school it might look a wee bit like a school science lesson maybe a little bit of ptsd coming from that but there was no gin in school last time I checked, so this is already 10 times better. Um, in front of you, we have a little recipe card alongside a gin wheel. Opposites will tend to bounce quite well off each other, and adjacents tend to pair quite nicely as well. Down the left-hand side of this sheet now, you have all of the botanicals available to you now this afternoon. Um, and what I would like you to do now is take your pen and tick the top three on that list. That is your holy trinity that we talked about next door. The juniper berries, the coriander seeds, and the angelical root. They must be included for this to be called a gin. And on top of that, it's totally up to you. So I would recommend using between six and 10 different botanicals. Um, anything over 10, you're really talking about over-egging the pudding a wee bit. Far, far too much going on. So the general rule of thumb is just less is more. Beside that then, you have all of your measurements, your suggested measurements, just from our distillers, not hard and fast rules, but if you do like something that is traditionally a London dry style gin, stick to the upper half for your Holy Trinity, so your 300, your 100, and your 30. If you like something typically more floral or citrusy, stick to the lower end, so your 250, your 50, and your 10. As I say, they are just suggestions, they're not hard and fast rules, so if you do fancy venturing outside of any of those boundaries, we do love a rebel here, so go for it. So in terms of collecting all of your different botanicals and your different ratios and quantities now, you have all of your equipment in front of you, all this glassware. Um, the juniper is in these blue bottles here. I would recommend now using your larger measuring cylinder for your juniper, because it's going to be in your gin in a much higher quantity than all of the other ones. Um, and in terms then of all of the other botanicals, they are in our Harry Potter cupboard at the side here and underneath our distillate bulbs at the front. You have then your much smaller measuring cylinder or any of your little syringes or your pipette. You can take those straight up. You're going to be taking them now out of these smaller little beakers at the bottom, however much you need. You'll bring it back then and pop it into your much larger mixing beaker. You have a little spoon here as well, just for aesthetic effect. So if you want to look nice and official, give it a wee stir about there as well. It's not going to make much of a difference. And um, once you then have all of your distillates collected up to your first 250 ml batch, it's now time to have a wee smell of it. Do not smell directly from this beaker. The surface area is so wide here that all the vapors will fly out and you'll burn your pipes a wee bit. You'll not really enjoy the rest of your afternoon. So what we have now to combat this is a little nosing glass. Pop a little splash of that now in there. Much smaller surface area, much gentler pull now of the vapors. 
once we have everything figured out then everything will end up in our much larger beaker this is where your 250 mil and your 500 mil will go and once you finish that up this is now going to be our final product so it's your very own personalized 500 milliliter bottle of gin you're gonna have your name and the date on the front alongside a little space for any notes on the side with that being said i think i've covered all of my instructions if you do have any questions as the afternoon progresses just grab myself i'll be dottering about here i will refill all of these little beakers as you take liquid from them but with that being said you do now have your instructions school is in session get the building some gin